Uh, Victor. Victor.
Uh, welcome, uh, friends and uh, members, to this uh, conversation today. We live in an era of uh, abandonment. So COVID-19 has led into abandonment of individuals, abandonment of friends, abandonment of struggles. Yet, it is in this context of uh, abandonment that um, we are all called upon to be more innovative and put energy to open new frontiers. So we thank very much the consortium of land actors who have pulled this together today. We have um, uh, our session today convened by the Kenya Land Alliance, Oxfam, Land Coalition, FAO, IPACC, the National Land Commission, and uh, uh, a bigger consortium of land actors in the country. And we thank you all for joining us. I can see the numbers are doing real well. We're now 65 participants enrolled in. Uh, in our conversation today, we would like to look at um, community land and uh, we want to look at how to advance these communal land rights in the context of COVID-19. And that context of COVID-19 is what I call is a context of uh, abandonment, abandoning, and sometimes everyone is left to be on their own. But yet, uh, for actors like ourselves, we never leave each other on their own. In the panel today, we have um, the CEO of uh, Kenyan Land Alliance, Ms. Faith Alube. Thank you, Faith. Faith, as uh, most of you may know, has a long history working in this sector, about 14 years, and uh, uh, joined the Kenyan Land Alliance about um, a year ago now, and uh, really putting it to a new trajectory. Okay, within the Faith. Then we have um, the chair, the National Land Commission, Wakili Otachi, Karibu Sana Mwenyukiti. Uh, it's nice really seeing you, sir, after a long while, and um, looking forward to this conversation with you. And uh, then we have uh, Dr. Sena. Uh, Dr. Sena uh, is um, Director of Indigenous Peoples of Africa uh, Coordinating Committee, IPACC. Dr. Okay, um, Doc will be joining us shortly. And then we have- um, is, is joined us, Steve. Sorry, I, I didn't get that. Oh, Doc, Dr. Sena. Yes. Last time I met you, you were looking for a, a long-term visa for somebody whom I won't mention. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to meet you once again. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. And Paul is a very lucky man. I have a great progenies. One of my greatest progeny among the many progenies is Madame Husna Barak, Barak, whom I have known for many, many years, working for FAO now. Um, uh, as a leader in the Land Natural Resources Governance Project. Karibu sana, Madam Husna. And then we have my sister, uh, Trufosa Achar. Trufosa Achar is a chair of, um, no. I only know her as a principal council, but today I was told she's a chair, but she is member of the working committee on implementation of community land acts. And uh, she's a chair. And the last time I met your team, Madame at uh, AACC, I realized you had done such a great job. Karibu sani, Madame. Thank you. Yes, I did. And then uh, finally, finally we have, who is the final one? Myself, no. Madam Grace Ananda, Grace Ananda, um, long-term activist, really done great work in Oxfam, advancing women land rights, the women land rights officer at Oxfam. Karibu uh, sana, uh, uh, Grace. My name is uh, Steve Oumakoth. I am the vice chair of the Judiciary Task Force on Alternative Justice System. And I'm also a member of the Kenya Land Alliance. So in our conversation today, I want to start by requesting um, the CEO of KLA, um, Faith Alube, 
to not only lay the context for us, but also present to us preliminary findings that uh, KLA uh, established uh, in a recent survey um, that reviewed how communities are engaging with the questions um, of the land rights and the, the feelings they have in the context of COVID-19. What are the uh, new obstacles? What are the new opportunities? And what are the new fears? So Faith, Karibu, the protocol of the session, I think we all know, uh, so we're going to have the presentation before. After that, I will invite some um, um, colleagues from outside the continent to give a few insights and then we'll have a Q&A. Please keep your mics on mute. If you don't mute them, we will help you do it, but please help us by keeping them muted. And then um, very soon we will be opening the chat space. We'd like you to start engaging the chat space. In fact, uh, you could already start by introducing yourself in the chat space. Um, and doing that, put in your name and just say where you are located at. And I will try and make sure this is as interactive as possible. So for now, Madam Faith Karibu Sana. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Um, first and foremost, I'd just like to appreciate uh, the panelists who've created time to, to just allow us to learn from them. Um, I deeply appreciate the participants that have logged on. It will be an interactive session, and this is just a first webinar of a series that Kenya Land Alliance intends to uh, conduct. Um, I'd like to appreciate uh, 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 Chair, National Land Commission. Thank you for availing yourself. Um, uh, Mr. Char, thank you for availing yourself so that we can learn from you. Ms. Uh, Usna, um, Madam Usna, <laughs> we worked together for such a while. Thank you. Thank you for availing yourself. We have Dr. Rika Nyinke. Thank you for availing yourself as well. Uh, Grace, uh, thank you. Uh, Kenya Land Alliance appreciates. And I'm sure eventually um, the participants will also appreciate your expertise uh, as you give them insights. Kenya Land Alliance um, is an organization, a non governmental organization that uh, is an umbrella organization that brings to together non-state actors that work on land justice. We advocate for policies that are people-centered. And uh, today, um, Hillary, maybe you can put up my PowerPoint. Um, today, we are, we, are, we are glad and honored to, to uh, gently convene this with our partners. Um, as I would said, KLA is an umbrella organization. It was founded in 1999. Uh, right now, we are at uh, around 50 members, and we'd encourage you to become a member. Our membership is growing. We are revamping it, and together we are going to even have more value additions. We, we don't close it. We, we want um, to have organizational members, individual members, academia, uh, even from the government, you can join individually. I uh, would be glad to, to share and learn from your expertise. As an individual member, you, you, uh, the membership fee is 2,000 shillings per year. Uh, an NGO is 5,000 shillings per year. A CBO is 2,500 per year. And uh, an international organization is 10,000 shillings a year. Uh, we normally try to have membership forums every quarter, and we are trying to improve that so that it is um, KLA membership, membership KLA, the communication channels are open. Uh, next slide, please, um, Hillary. So as uh, Dr. Tari had, had, had mentioned, Kenya Land Alliance undertook a survey. Uh, we shared um, monkey surveys um, to our partners, to, to, to our members, and we were able to get feedback. Uh, we shared this after three months. Um, we shared this in May, where we wanted to find out uh, uh, what is the impact of COVID-19 on communal land rights. And that's, and, and, and hence this, this webinar. We feel that um, even as much as we are limited in our movements, as much as we are limited in the, in the way we've been working, the, the protection and safeguarding of communal land rights should not stop 
it should continue. It's just, we just change the way we work. We change the way we live rent and we, we, we try and fix structural issues or structural weaknesses that have been exposed by, by uh, the pandemic. Some of the structural uh, 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 weaknesses that have been exposed or been, uh, have been brought forefront by the pandemic is the fact that there is now slow access to justice. Uh, and I know panelists will be sharing that and I'll also be sharing our findings. Uh, we'll release this report uh, by tomorrow. If you log on to the Kenya Land Alliance uh, website, you'll be able to get the full report. Uh, we were able to, to get feedback from state actors, non-state actors and the community. So this we are just relaying uh, uh, what the communities uh, uh, feel about this period. And we hope through this webinar, we'll be able to achieve at least two things. Number one, we'll be able to understand uh, the Kenyan laws that have been passed. Where are they in Africa? Is it a best practice? And the experts are here. They are going to tell us, is it working? What have they learned? And across Africa, it will also be interesting to hear from you from your country after we share our case studies. Um, is, it, is it something we can compare and learn? And then uh, the second objective of this webinar is just to start the conversation. We are starting this conversation at uh, the Kenyan space and at the regional level. I am sure we will partner further with IELTS. We, we, we talk more about this under different CBIs so that we can be able to just um, understand how do we uh, protect land marginalized communities. So digging into the, the, the findings, we were able to sample. Um, please put up the, the PowerPoint so that uh, people can follow. We were able to get feedback from 25 representatives from the non-state actors. This, this um, uh, consists of CBOs that we work with, NGOs that we work with, and 16 representatives from government agencies also gave us feedback and 34 community members. Uh, this, was, this feedback was over a period of a month. Uh, we did purposive sampling because as you understand, um, we could not go to the field. Uh, we just wanted to understand generally uh, uh, how are land, mar land marginalized communities coping. Organizations that, that contributed to this survey uh, were drawn from, both, from, from almost 14 counties. And we hope that it is representative enough. Um, we were able to just understand how, how, what processes were going on and they've been stopped. And I know the panelists are going to cover some of these issues that I will highlight. Uh, let's move on, Hilary. Uh, from the non-state actors, these are the key findings. They felt like um, the lack of community land tenure security. They felt that with the stopping of, let me not call stopping, but now the pandemic has stopped the registration process. They felt like they lacked land tenure security. And they felt like they would like to, to be informed by duty bearers how they'd move forward because some of them had started the process. And I'm very glad that Madam Achar is here. She's going to speak to the inventories that some of us had submitted and where they are at. Some of the non-state actors also observed that there is um, Gentlemen, there's irregular sale of community lands. There's illegal subdivisions going on because uh, uh, livelihoods, people's livelihoods have been interrupted. So what people are doing is to sell small, small pieces of land to be able to survive. So that is also a finding that we, we got. Delay of access to justice, especially from widows who had certain succession processes. It was mentioned more than once. Uh, people who wanted to access the registry, despite the ministry giving notices, some of us were not aware, so we were caught unaware. I know the ministry gave, um, um, they gave sufficient notice, but some of us were caught unaware. So they feel like their, their access to the form of justice they wanted was delayed. Uh, the role of women in the governance of natural resources also uh, came to the fore. Most women still feel like um, their voices are not heard in the communal land tenure. It will be interesting to hear uh, um, what is happening across Africa during this time in regards to women land rights. And then uh, we move to government. Uh, we just wanted to understand how was the pandemic affected officers that work in land registries, uh, duty bearers. 
uh, one of the things that was pointed out was that it is no longer eight to five like they are used to. They are going an extra mile to try and help communities, but they'd like to have a way of disseminating their new ways of working so that the communities can interact. It's a unique space all of us are in and we are, we are trying to work with it. So I hope also this, this webinar series will be able to inform people that will log on how the government is working, how different it will be. Addressing of arising land disputes, it was also pointed out that some of those processes have been halted because most of them are ADR uh, processes or, or AJS processes, which require face-to-face -face meetings. So most of the uh, 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 government officials pointed out that they cannot attend these meetings because of the pandemic. Uh, moving along, moving along, Hillary. Uh, findings from the community members. Uh, the community members had a lot to say. Uh, they pointed out what the, the non-state actors, the organizations had pointed out, insecure community land tenure. They felt that um, their land rights are not protected, especially in areas where mega projects are ongoing and uh, compensation uh, uh, discussions are still hanging in the air. They felt like their land tenure is still not very secure. Uh, women and governance of community lands have, as, as I've said, uh, is still an issue. Uh, there are communities that still refer to women as kids. So these women felt like there has to be some proactive actions from the from government or duty bearers who are registering community lands to ensure that women are included. And clear dispute resolution mechanisms was also pointed out, as I have said before, awareness around how the government intends to engage with community is still not communities is still not clear. Uh, this is just one of the avenues, and I and I hope from this, uh, duty bearers are going to uh, mute better ways of engaging and disseminating the new ways of working. Impact on food security. I know um, Husna is going to touch this in depth. But one of the things that they mentioned, um, one of the key challenges is the closure of small open air markets that most of them, especially women, could go and sell their farm produce. So with the closure of the markets, uh, their livelihoods have been compromised. So most of them have gone back to the farm, going back to the farm without having better planning um, as, as compromised their, their, their quality of livelihoods. Uh, I know Husna is going to go in depth. Um, uh, yeah, impact on food security, Usna is going to look at Kenyan and continental aspects. Um, water and requisite sanitation, that is according to Article 43 of, our, of the Kenyan constitution, most of the community members felt that they do not have adequate uh, 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 clean water, uh, despite water being one of the key components of curtailing uh, uh, the, 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 the pandemic, they felt that duty bearers should improve on that. Impact on gender roles, there are some men now who've had to step up, there are some women who've had to step up. They've been different allocations of roles, and it's a new space even at household level, that's what we discovered. So as we speak about interruption, systematic interruptions caused by the by the virus. It's not only at continental level or at, at regional level or at national level, even at the household space, um, gender roles have changed. As I conclude, I'd like to say that we are going to release, we're going to upload um, uh, this briefer, at least by today after, after this webinar. And I hope that we've, we've, we'll learn a lot as we continue planning for for, for a series of them where we are bringing together duty bearers, right holders, developmental partners, and CSOs just to discuss how do we work within this unique space that uh, uh, um, we found ourselves in without compromising the rights of right holders or without duty bearers failing to deliver, to improve service delivery. Thank you very much, Dr. Terry and welcome to all participants that have logged on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Faith. That was extremely uh, articulate and uh, well pointed. I think one of the key messages that uh, Faith is bringing, and I think a key narrative we want to roll through here, is that uh, ultimately 
the struggle for expanding security of land tenure for a majority of our people must be led by the community members themselves in their own spaces. And uh, this is not about formalization or commodification of land. It's about making sure that land retains its sanctity, its meaning as a source of life, as a source of identity, and so on. And thanks, Faith. I also think that um, Faith has pointed us to certain important uh, limitations that emerge when physical encounters are, uh, are interfered with, because the people who are, most who are in precarious situations of land tenure are people who access or uh, claim those rights mainly through physical encounters. So we have to think a bit more then in this context as she's guided us on what do we do to make sure that there's no plowback uh, during these days. I want to request that um, I gave uh, Faith a little bit of uh, extended time because she was giving a whole uh, research uh, finding. Uh, for the rest of the panelists, please, let's try to keep it to 10 minutes. Uh, thank you for those joining us in the conversation and uh, welcome as uh, Faith has also invited you in. I want to request you to continuously introduce yourself in the platform. If you have a question, start flagging up the questions because um, we will not be able to have everybody on the mic, but as your questions come in, we are organizing them in the portal and we'll get an opportunity to have all of them responded to. Now it's time to invite the representative of the Cabinet Secretary of uh, Land, Madam uh, um, Farida Karenoi. I'd already introduced um, the rep initially, that is Ms. Achar. Ms. Achar has had a long, long, long tenure in the Ministry of Land as um, a senior uh, council, and I'm happy to have worked with her uh, while working on various statutes that affect um, land issues in the country. And she's going to talk to us on something that has been alluded to by uh, Madam Faith, and that is lessons that uh, have been learned by the Ministry of Land in the process of registering community land. So it's really trying to ground, trying to ground the kind of um, uh, findings that uh, Faith had. Madam Achar, Karibu, na unadakika kumi, asanti. Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, our moderator, um, Chairman, National Land Commission, Faith, Madam Musna, all the panelists, and uh, all the participants that have joined us from different uh, organization, development partners, civil societies, our brothers from outside Kenya, and everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'll assume you said good afternoon. Thank you to technology. So um, today we are here basically um, as a nation, as a country, to, to look at the gains and probably um, what are the lessons that we've learned from uh, the, the aspect of implementation of Community Land Act? And more specifically, uh, what lessons uh, uh, have we learned from um, community land registration process? And secondly, we're also going to talk about lessons that we've learned from registering land marginalized communities, the challenges and gaps and the best practices. Uh, you'll bear me witness that's kind of a, a very huge topic for all of us, but allow me just to, to brush uh, quickly on some of the experiences we've had as government, uh, as a working group on implementation of community land act. Uh, so, um, from last year, uh, 2019, July up to about February before the onset of COVID, we were able to uh, carry out public education in over 23 counties uh, within the, the nation and related sub-counties. And uh, these counties basically is where we have a huge portion of land that is Community Land Act land basically uh, the land that is unregistered so um, 
most of the counties also are dominantly pastoralist counties. Um, and uh, so to what I'm supposed to share in the meeting, the lessons we learned uh, from the community land registration process, one, uh, we have the act, which is, uh, is a fairly old act, but I think we started implementation a little bit uh, late. Uh, not to mention that it's a very good act and uh, also not to mention that all of us are aware of the provisions, the roles that different actors have, both state, non-state actors, uh, county government, national government, national land commission, the role of the development partners, civil society that have played great role in community uh, education, sensitization, awareness creation. So um, the greatest lesson, number one, uh, I want to say that um, there has been great synergy, collaboration, and partnership with regards to uh, conducting of uh, uh, sensitization and awareness creation. And I want to uh, commend the civil society who on the onset of 2016, when the act was passed, they went to the ground, they started sensitizing the community. And I want to say that uh, the community that was sensitized by the civil society way back in 2016, up to around 2019 when we started implementing this are way ahead as far as the, the knowledge and the provisions of the act and what is required of them. So I think that great synergy, that great collaboration, that great approach of networking and partnership in conducting our awareness creation is key. So uh, the other thing uh, we've seen is harnessing resources from development partners, CBOs, government, we've harnessed resources to create awareness, to build the capacity of the communities, uh, the, the concerned communities uh, in a way that they are aware of their land. And I think there's more that need to be done as far as that is concerned. So the other thing um, on the lessons that we've learned there's a great buy-in from the communities and all the actors that are involved. The county government are very supportive and they are willing to roll out this act amidst the, the gaps that are there. The development partner, the civil societies, Wanjiko, the affected community themselves, there's this great buy-in that everyone wants to see the last of community land uh, registered. And so that is something that we noted and uh, is something that is recommendable in all the 24 counties that uh, we visited uh, while we are conducting public education and also the support, the synergies in all our meeting, we had the presence of county government, we had the presence of the civil society working in the areas to support this agenda for registering community land. We had the community members themselves, those that are organized their community land management committee and so on and so forth. So the other thing that we noted and that is commended is that um, the community are ready. And with regards to the readiness of the community, I want to say that uh, all the communities spread in the 24 counties are at different levels of readiness. Uh, where we had uh, sensitization and awareness creation on community land act carried earlier, the readiness level is higher than some communities where we have more awareness that need to be done. And so those are some of the great lessons that we've learned uh, while we were going around. And when we are looking at our preparedness, when we are conducting public education. And the other thing that I must say is that um, the communities want their land registered. That is the only way they feel they are able to secure and protect and also exploit the enormous resources that are locked 
uh, under the unregistered community land. So I think that is something that uh, the community, the actors, Wanjiko, national government, county government, all the actors, that is something that we all desire and is something that we are all doing one or two actions here and there, putting resources here and there to see that the last of uh, the community land uh, are registered. I want to give um, um, a case study. Uh, to date, we have um, a case study of uh, a, a group ranch in uh, Laikipia, Laikipia North being the first group ranch that have been uh, converted uh, from, or that have been, uh, that have transitioned from uh, being a group ranch, basically a group ranch is a community land to, to, to being registered as a community land. So we have in uh, that was a group ranch that, but is now uh, in Gwesi community land. And I want to commend the civil society that all the partners that have worked so hard uh, in Laikipia. We have around 23 group ranches in Laikipia. And I think Laikipia is one of the areas where the awareness levels as far as the community land is con act is concerned are so high. And I think we have uh, the second uh, group ranch that is just about to transition from being a group ranch to uh, community, and I want to recommend actually the 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 civil society, groups, uh, action aid, Oxfam, a lot of civil society that have put concerted effort in Laikipia to see that the twenty three group ranches are transitioned to uh, to community land. Now to the second uh, issue that. Uh, I'm supposed to uh, share uh, quickly the lessons uh, from registering land marginalized community. And I think from the onset, I mentioned that uh, most of the, the, the majority of the 24 counties where we have great chunk of unregistered community land uh, are dominantly pastoralist. I want to mention like Narok, uh, when you talk of Garissa, when you talk of Fajia, when you talk of um, uh, Marsabit, when you talk of Tana River, when you talk to Kajiado, just a cross board, you realize some of them, or if not most of them, are predominantly pastoralist. So, uh, what are the uh, lessons from land from registering land marginalized community? So we are not yet there. I think we just started the first process of sensitization, awareness, creation, public education. But from the engagements that we've had with over 25,000 uh, citizens that reside where we have community land, it, is, it came out clearly and loudly that uh, uh, together and uh, as, as a team, as partners, uh, we need to, to be in sync as to how we approach the registration process. And uh, before I go to the, to the lesson that we learned uh, from registering um, land in marginalized community. So uh, we, we have, have- Two minutes to go, please. Two minutes to go, two minutes to go. Okay, quickly. So we have those factors that uh, are very keen and that uh, will affect uh, this, that as we work together, we, we need to look at. We, we have the, the challenge of boundary issues, number one, and two, we have the definition of a community. When you say definition of a community, do you mean a tribe, do you mean a clan, do you mean a sub-county, do you mean the entire county, so those are some of the, 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 the lessons that we, we noted there and the challenges that as we approach this, we need to look at a way of how we define this uh, uh, community. The, the other thing that uh, we, we also learned in, in closing and a gap is that um, there, 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 there's so much information out there that is not aligned to how the provision of the act mm -hmm. is. 
So we need, as we continue sensitizing, as we continue talking to the community, we need to align them to how the step-by-step -step approach of registration is, uh, is uh, approached. Now, in closing, in closing, best practices that we can adapt, I've talked about networking, building synergies, collaboration, and having common strategies that we can use to approach the whole aspect of registration. Number two, partners, uh, all actors, county governments have their role, national government, national land commission, development partners, CBOs, can we work together? We should be innovative in approaching registration. Can you adopt a county? Can you adopt a, a community that you want to walk through the whole process as a CBO, as an NGO, as a development partner? Where are our IC material? Can we collaborate? And there's so much more we can share, but thank you, uh, our moderator. And sorry if I've taken more than my share minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Achar. Uh, that was uh, illuminating. I would like to suggest that um, we make it discursive. So what I'll be doing uh, for the uh, speakers coming in, I may, I may throw one or two questions to you to embed in your presentation. Madam Achar will bring you back later after the presentation from the chair of the National Land Commission to read for us a statement from the cabinet secretary land. So we'll bring you back later before we go fully Pan-African. For now, I want to invite um, Mr. Otachi. Mr. Otachi is a, a council of many years, 29 years to be specific. Uh, I'm sure in the next role, he will be uh, knighted a senior council. And um, he wants to expand basically on what um, have been raised by Madam Achar on the questions of um, the experience of the National Land Commission in uh, safeguarding community land rights in this era of uh, COVID. And uh, Mr. Otachi, perhaps as you do that, I would like to request you to open by engaging this question. What do we mean by unregistered land? Does registered land mean registered to the state? Does it mean formalization to the state? And, that, and that's a very important question because it's a question that um, Madam Achar also mentioned from the margins when she mentioned the question of who is a community. So I'd be happy if you took that as your entry point. And here you are, you have your 10 minutes, sir. Karibu sana. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I can be heard. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, uh, let me um, uh, comment and uh, appreciate uh, the organizers of this forum, the Kenya Land, Land Alliance, International Land Coalition, FAO and Oxfam, and all the partners for bringing together the participants to share knowledge and experience around this important uh, subject. Now, um, just a quick uh, background for those who may not know what the National Commission is. The National Commission is uh, established under 60, Article 67 and 248 of the, the Constitution of Kenya. And it was formed to actualize the intent of the National Land Policy 2009 to spearhead the land reform agenda in Kenya. So it is an independent, uh, constitutional uh, commission. Now, it's important to note that uh, over 29 African countries have independent land commissions, uh, but out of all those, only two are constitutional commissions. That is uh, the, the one that I had and uh, the Ghana Land Commission which are established uh, by constitution. And why that is important is that, uh, particularly for the National Land Commission of Kenya, uh, uh, when it's, it's embedded in the constitution, it helps secure the sovereignty of the people, uh, secure observance by all state organs and uh, state organs of democratic values and principles and promote constitutionalism. Now, uh, to contextualize the discussion on community land, 
in, 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 uh, in, in Kenya. Uh, if we look at the broader view of Africa, uh, up to about 80% of all lands in Sub-Saharan Africa are what would uh, be classified as community land the way we have uh, conceptualized it in, in, in Kenya. And in Kenya, uh, studies show that uh, we have an estimated 70% of land classified as community land in Kenya. And <clears throat> that is about uh, 4.3 million hectares. And, and to answer the question that uh, was um, asked about unregistered land, uh, Sorry, uh, looks like uh, chair has a small internet uh, problem there. We hoping that uh, the... most of the Sasharkan uh, is not registered. Chair, we lost you. We lost you at some point there. Can you kindly go back to introducing the question and then you proceed? We lost you uh, in for some five seconds or so. Okay. Chair? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, you are clear and audible now. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you very much. So I was trying to answer the question about uh, registered land, and I was pointing out that um, uh, the large percentage, a very large percentage of uh, of, of uh, the land mass in Kenya, is not registered. Is not in the register as we know it, in the sense that uh, it is. Uh, it is surveyed and uh, it's marked surveyed and titled. Uh, and it's only a, a, a smaller portion of it, uh, I think about 30%, and as I said, I, I can be corrected by Mr. Shar on this, it's only a smaller portion of it, about 30% that is actually uh, registered. So most of the community land is, is not registered land. It is not uh, formally surveyed and, uh, and 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 then uh, following which now you have uh, you have it uh, formally registered. Uh, it's also important to bear in mind that again that a large portion of of, of, of that land, uh, particularly in um, northeastern and the northern uh, you know uh, areas of Kenya, is either arid or semi-arid. Uh, so we are talking about in terms of the, of the size. So there are about eighteen counties. Uh, that that have land that they count as uh, community land, and the majority of those are in the northeastern, eastern, and parts of uh, the Rift Valley. <clears throat> now, what then is the? Um, but before I go to that, the, 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 let, let me also point out that uh, in the context of the mandate of the National Land Commission, uh, it must also be pointed out that these community lands that we talk about uh, are interspersed with other uh, land that's classified under other categories. There's private land and there's public land. And uh, the National Commission is mainly uh, mandated to manage uh, public land, although it has other, other mandates with regard to other aspects of land. Now, uh, it's, I say it's in, it's in the, the um, community land is interspersed, interspersed with other land in the sense that uh, Within community land, you'll find private land. Within uh, community land, you will find uh, public land in the sense of forests, game reserves, and catchment areas. So that eventually, when you're saying that we, we are coming to um, a scenario of, 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 uh, of titling and identifying the boundaries of, of, of uh, community land, we have all those uh, you know, all together. Now, uh, what is the role of National Land Commission uh, in relation to community land? Uh, the National Commission has a mandate relating to um, uh, proposing land policy to, uh, to national government. Uh, it has a mandate relating to oversight in planning uh, of, of land and it provides advice on registration uh, and uh, it deals with the uh, research on land and natural resources with a view to advising uh, national government. 
And uh, another important mandate is that of uh, uh, traditional disputes resolution, uh, which the National Commission under the Constitution is, um, is mandated to, to encourage. Now, uh, coming now more specifically, I don't know how many minutes I've taken, but more specifically to the issue I was um, asked to address because I've given the background. Uh, this yes, Chair, I had to brief you on the minutes you've taken. I'm sorry, looks like you're frozen again there. You have uh, four minutes to go, Chair. Sorry, we lose, seems like we lost uh, Chair there again. The Pardon me? Yes. You Mr. lost me again? Yes. Welcome back. You have two minutes to go. Two minutes to go. Sorry. I, I don't know whether I've been lost again. I have a, a slight problem with my internet. I don't know why it keeps on. Now you're Can you back. Hear me now? You, you're back now with two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. So uh, what kind of investments uh, are we able to talk about in, in areas where your community land? Uh, examples, uh, Turukana. We have uh, oil, Laikipia, uh, sanctuaries, Tana River, irrigation farming, Kajiado, real estate, Isiolo, Lapset project, Masterbit, wind power, and Kitui, coal mining. Those are some of, 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 the, um, of, of, of the investments that, uh, that uh, we have in some of those areas. Now, on the effect of COVID, uh, COVID has had an effect on all of us. Uh, it has had a negative effect, but also a positive effect. A few positive effects, like uh, being able to have this kind of forum we have now, which ordinarily would have been uh, a physical meeting in, in our hotel room. What are the issues that we have around uh, challenges that, uh, that uh, those in the community lands face? Now, in Kenya, a large number uh, of those who are under the community lands are, are pastoralists. And people who are, a number of them, a, a, a number of communities fairly nomadic. And with those kind of scenarios, they, they do not have the advantage of technology that we have. And being able to have physical meetings to resolve their issues, to be reached upon to discuss how to move forward with registration is, 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 a, is a challenge. So I, I think that that is a, the, the um, in my view, the, the main challenge over and above all the other challenges that we, all of us face uh, in this uh, COVID scenario. Uh, I think 10 minutes is, like, is actually much shorter than I actually thought. So I think I'll try my best to summarize, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Utachi. You've done very well. Uh, we will have a more robust engagement during the Q&As. And uh, I'm glad that you have uh, helped us to recall that this is actually a Pan-African question. Uh, I was waiting for somebody to flag that correlation that um, it's only Kenya and Ghana where the land commissions are constitutional bodies. And that of course means, Chair, that uh, it's from only Kenya and Ghana that we should expect much, much more because the more you're protected, the better you deliver. Uh, but we'll come back to that again during Q&A. Allow me, uh, members, to bring back again um, a Kenyan discussant for just five minutes, uh, and then we go the um, trans-African border route. And uh, we would like to request Madam Achar to come back again and read for us the remarks that have been sent over by the Cabinet uh, Secretary for Land uh, which I think would help us to situate even our conversations further. After that, then, we'll go to hear from other colleagues who will situate this question in a Pan-African context. Welcome back, Madam Achara. Yeah, thank you, our moderator, the panelists, all the audience listening to us. Um, I have uh, a speech, uh, a message from our cabinet secretary, Madam Farida Karanoi, uh, Cabinet Secretary for Ministry of, uh, uh, Ministry of Lands and uh, Physical Planning. And uh, I'll go straight and read uh, a keynote address for this meeting. So um, the topic, 
advancing community tenure in the contents of COVID-19 um, pandemic, a case of land marginalized community in Kenya and across Africa. Uh, during a virtual meeting uh, scheduled for Tuesday, July 2018. Keynote address by Farida Karenoi, uh, EGH, Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Lands and Physical Planning. So I'm reading this on behalf of the Cabinet Secretary and I'll go ahead to read it. The Chairman, National Land Commission, the CEO, Kenya Land Alliance, Director of Indigenous People, Africa Coordinating Committee, uh, IPAC, Leader, Land and the National Resource uh, Governance, FAO of the UN, the Vice Chair of the Judicial Tax Force on Alternative Justice System, Chair, Working Group on Implementation of Community Land Act, Women Land Rights Officers present, National Land Commission Officers present, National and County Government Officers present, Civil Society Organization Representative present, Community Representative present, ladies and gentlemen. I take this opportunity to thank you uh, for attending this crucial consultative forum on advancing, on advancement of communal land tenure in the contents of COVID pandemic. The government recognizes the need to register community land and registered land accounts for nearly 70% uh, of the county's total land mass. This is the reason the Community Land 2016 was passed into law by parliament in September 2016. Regulation to implement the act were formulated in November 2017 and approved by parliament in June 2018. In general, sorry, the general objective of the act is to provide for the recognition, protection, and registration of community land rights, management and administration of community land, and to provide for the role of the county government in relation to registration of community land. Land, as we know, is our co community most important resource. This is recognized this is a recognized link, sorry, there's a recognized link between secure land rights and the county's growth and investment climate. Security of tenure is almost important for social inclusion, particularly for historical disadvantaged communities, such as the pastoralists whose land have never been registered. Communities will have direct control over natural resources and a better bargaining position with investors if their land is registered. The ministry, in consultation with the National Land Commission, with the support of European Union, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, commenced the implementation of the act in July 2019. A joint working group on implementation of Community Land Act was formed to oversee the implementation of this act. The working group in consultation with state and non-state actors came up with a working plan that contained 15 key activities that are deemed pertinent to the actualization of the act. In carrying out the activities, the Ministry of Lands and Physical, Pla Physical Planning has put in place the governance structures and personnel to enhance the implementation of the act. These include training of over 600 technical officers, both from the national government, that is the Ministry of Lands and Physical Planning and the National Land Commission, and also designation of community land registrars in different counties. The officers have started working closely with the county government mm -hmm. and the concerned communities to actualize the act. To date, the working group in, on implementation of Community Land Act has carried out national public education in 23 out of the 24 counties 
and related sub-counties. Over 25,000 citizens, including national and county government representatives and communities, have been sensitized in preparation for the registration of community land within their jurisdiction. Consolidative forums have been held with the civil society organizations, professional bodies, relevant parliamentary land committees in the Senate and National Assembly, and the pastoralist parliamentary group. Five out of the nine counties, which are under foul land governance program for attainment of Vision 2030, have submitted inventories of their respective communities in the readiness for the registration process. Ladies and gentlemen, the act recognizes the importance of cooperation, consultation, and collaboration among stakeholders in the implementation. Huge financial resources are required for the next phase of implementation. The establishment of community land rights that shall entail registration of communities, demarcation and adjudication of community land in the 24 counties. This will call for a joint implementation strategy that will enhance better coordination identification of critical activities and harnessing resources from both national and county government, civil society, UN agencies, and other development partners. More so, resources will be required to empower communities to form the required structures in readiness for the actual registration. Different community land management committees will have to be sensitized which will be formed by the communities from time to time in the registration process. We'll have to be sensitized on their role, besides the community will have to be educated on the need to develop their constitution, their bylaw, and putting in place required structures that will help them in the registration process. Ladies and gentlemen, Goodwill is key to the implementation process. This will enhance and facilitate the registration of community land. The national government, the National Land Commission, county government, communities have a greater constitutional and legal responsibility in the realization of the registration of community land. The overall the oversight role of parliament in the implementation process is critical to ensure that the act is actualized. We have identified provisions in the house which require amendment and the approval of parliament. The proposed amendment will be subjected to necessary legislative process. Ladies and gentlemen, we should therefore have frank discussion and genuine contribution that will provide an elaborate strategy that will provide effective approach to achieving registration of the vast community land in Kenya. I call upon county government in consultation with the communities to expedite the process of submitting inventory of unregistered community land within their jurisdiction in preparation for the rollout of an elaborate adjudication program. This forum should therefore offer an appropriate platform for us to share our experiences, lessons learned in the implementation of the act that should lead to development of efficient strategies with which relate with related structures and resources harnessed for successful implementation of the act. There was enormous support and collaboration from 23 county government where public education was carried out. There was also great buy-in from the communities. This points out to the highest expectation and willingness of community, state and non-state actors in making registration of community land a reality. The COVID pandemic has significantly affected the operation at the ministry. We scaled down our operation in line with the presidential directive and guidelines provided by the Ministry of Health. The government has acknowledged 
that digital technology can and will play a critical role in strengthening resilience by enabling fast responses to this crisis while helping elevating its impact. The ministry has taken cognizance of the need to digital technology as enabling environment for human resilience during difficult economic times through cashless payment and digital transaction. E-conveyancing platform help to maintain social distancing and reduce the potential spread of COVID. This, this there is no gun saying that the platform are gaining transactions today. Digital infrastructure is being is helping community to safeguard uh, and navigate the epidemic. The ministry has acknowledged technology as one of the innovations innovative approach that are helping society respond to the minimal to minimize the impact of the epidemic. The enactment of business amendment law is key to, be, to business in general and the land sector in particular. The ministry is leveraging technology to spur inclusive growth and facilitate paperless land transaction. The government initiated the development and implementation of the national land and management, national land information and management system in July 2019. This initiative will forestall similar disruption in land transactions in the future. We are currently engaging our stakeholders in the process. The, digital, the digitization process will be carried out in four phases. The first phase of this process is the digitization of Nairobi City Council County, which should be complete by the end of the first quarter of 2020-2021 financial year. The second phase in this process is the digitization Sorry, um, I'll, I'll come again with that. Um, the second phase, which will be conducted in the second quarter of the 2020-2021 financial year, will focus on the metropolis, Kajiado, Ngong, Thika, Gatundu, Roiru, Machakos, and Moranga registries. We will do another 15 counties in the third and fourth quarter of the financial year 2020-2021. The rest of the registries will be digitized in the financial year 2021-2022. Enormous resources will be required in this project and we will still appeal to parliament for more budgetary allocation and our development partners for support. Once again, I take this chance to thank FAO, European Union, civil society organizations that have taken time and resources to sensitize and educate to different communities uh, on community land and other development partners for the support they have given to the citizens of this nation. I'm very optimistic that this partnership will continue to grow and all community in the country, all community land in the country will be registered. I look forward to fruitful deliberation in this forum. Thank you. I conclude the remarks uh, for the cabinet secretary, Madam Farida Karenoi. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, members and uh, of the panel and participants. I'm sure you reckon that took a bit of time, but it was very important that uh, series of policy statements there uh, for you in civil society. I can see we have uh, Action Aid here. I can see we have Chris Owala. I can see we have Ikal. I can see we have uh, Pamoja Trust. We have Groots. I can see we have um, um, Brian. We have many civil society organizations. Please 
list that in the portal for me to recognize you. You've had, and there are members, many members of KLA are, are also, uh, yes, many members of KLA are also online here. You've had there are some amendments coming. That's a minister's statement. So you need to engage with these amendments to make sure that um, they do exactly what the minister has suggested. Now we want to move to the second phase of this conversation, and that is the Pan-African phase. And I want to request my colleagues, really, I'm not belittling the role of um, the other locations out of Kenya, but uh, you'll allow that uh, you take a little bit of a muted time, and that will enable us to have a robust Q&A. So please indulge us uh, with that request that uh, you, you make it a bit a bit short, and uh, we'll start with uh, Grace. Grace, um, who has had a long career, uh, not only working at Oxfam, but has worked uh, with um, various land initiatives, uh, partnering with other regions, such as the uh, East African community, ECOWAS, um, SADC, and uh, therefore extremely knowledgeable. And Grace, wants to present to us as well findings of um, another important study that has been undertaken by Oxfam that explores um, how women uh, and most of the land rights have been affected in this context of COVID-19. And um, I'm sure Grace, you will indulge me um, to take uh, uh, not too short time, but not too long time which is equal to eight minutes. Grace Karibu, and thanks for your indulgence. Okay, thank you so much. Um, good morning, uh, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you are listening me from. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kenya Land Alliance for giving Oxfam Pan-Africa uh, program a platform to share the research that uh, we conducted a few months ago when coronavirus was declared a pandemic. First, I would like to say that the Pan-Africa program strives to address the power imbalances between women and men to bring sustainable change. We advocate for increased and res responsible public and private investment that supports small scale farmers, especially women, in realizing their rights and entitlement to food security. Uh, good land governance is cited as critical to achieving Agenda 2063 and the recommendation is that member states move towards a location of 30% of land to women. For instance, to achieve full gender equality, the EU Goal 17, the implementation plan recommends that 20% of rural women have access to land and natural resources by 2023. Just, we are just a few years away to realize this uh, goal. Uh, um, I also want to thank uh, civil society organizations who have actively participated in uh, Kilimanjaro Initiative uh, movement that aims at creating space for rural women, small scale farmers to participate in decision making processes about land and natural resources. So as we speak about land and women land rights, the AU has laid down framework and guidelines and other legally binding document in relation to women land rights, we have the VGGT, we have uh, the Maputo Protocol, we have large scale land based investment. Now that we have COVID-19 here with us, it has negatively impacted on land governance in Africa. The crisis, the COVID-19 crisis and the measures taken to curb the pandemic impact poor people heavily from land, from land perspective we've realized that there's lots of livelihood options, especially the informal sector and depending, uh, now women, small scale farmers are really depending on handouts. Some of them even unable to continue with their uh, farm work. And we've also seen there's a depending level of poverty, food insecurity and inequality. Suspensions of democratic control and the use of violence against environmental and human rights defenders, it, it has been in, in the rise. The closing of land administration services, as Faith had said earlier, as part of lockdown measures, restricted movement, and social distancing. Uh, at the end of 2019, African women celebrated Beijing Plus 24, 25, sorry, 
uh, with renewed hope and optimism for progress in fight for their rights. Unfortunately, the outbreak of COVID-19 has eroded this achievement, including women access to land and property rights. But I'm also seeing it as an opportunity for women rights organizations to continue with advocacy related work on land within their countries. The World Bank estimates that just under 13% of African women claim sole ownership of land compared to that of, of women. Uh, uh, kindly remove the, screen, the shared screen. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thank you. I think I've, I've lost something. All right, that's fine. So it's due to all this that uh, uh, the Oxfam Pan Africa program and ILC under the auspice of civil society platform undertook a rapid assessment in form of survey to understand the impact of COVID-19 to land rights actors in Africa, particularly to the housing, land tenure, livelihood, and property rights for women and girls. So the survey was meant to establish how land rights actors are responding and adjusting to the effect of COVID-19 in their own spaces. And we were able to reach out to 75 civil society in sub-Saharan Africa. And the report also features insight on women land rights during COVID-19 crisis. The report will be shared with us in due course. So some of the key findings from the research were uh, food security, Faith mentioned this, and uh, women who contribute 70% of African food production and make up to 90 to, to 80 to 90 percent of this involved in food processing, storage, and transportation. And with COVID-19, they've been vastly affected uh, because now they are unable to do all this. We've also realized there's loss of asset and land access and growing inequality. Poor people in rural rural areas and urban areas are at risk of losing their land and property due to forced eviction. And uh, I'm seeing that uh, if if the government doesn't move with speed, we might end up realizing that most of this land end up to uh, end up to wrong hands. Uh, for example, uh, somebody being evicted from a land from the land that he has acquired, and now going back to the court again, it's going to be a process because of the COVID-19 uh, uh, restricted movement, uh, social distancing, and all that. We've also seen lack of due diligence in land-based investment. It is at yet unclear how the expected global uh, crisis will affect investment flow. There might be financial crisis, which might limit investment possibility for major players. However, we may see an increase in a destructive capitalism and government might be tempted to attract investments to finance recovery from the crisis without observing due diligence. Uh, and finally, We've seen uh, human, human land rights defenders, they're in struggle and their key allies in addressing challenges posed by COVID-19. I feel they should be recognized and protected. We've seen cases whereby uh, land rights defenders being arrested by police during the lockdowns, such as documented in Uganda, Cameroon, and also other parts of Africa. And this one should be addressed immediately, especially given that these activists are going out of their way to protect the right of the vulnerable despite the quarantine measures, which makes it difficult uh, for land rights defenders to, to go and launch complaints. Uh, it, as I conclude, I feel the pandemic has exposed uh, gender inequality as women have been pushed out of space they normally use to earn a living. Women have completely been locked out of agricultural value chain and men have been left in control. Among the evident COVID-19 effects are halting the programs to secure tenor security for women, institutional support for land rights and conflict management, and diversion of state and donor resources towards emergency response. I'm afraid that COVID-19 is developing into several land rights and land governance crises. We face a serious risk that the gain of two decades of investing in land governance for sustainable and equitable development are undergone. So the Pan-Africa Civil Society Platform on Land as a governing continental uh, body is out to see that uh, 
the shared duty to map the problem and suggest adequate resources. The impact of COVID-19 crisis need to be placed at the center of discussion from the regional, national, and also the continental uh, policy makers uh, table. Efforts to mitigate risk to land rights should be stepped up. The members of the civil society platform, where most of our members here uh, sit in, is committed in monitoring development on the ground to protect the initiative that aim to improve sustainable and equitable land governance and to develop a strong knowledge agenda on these issues. So I just have like three uh, takeaways for the governments and also civil society in the long term and also in the medium term and also immediately. So the issues I raised call for immediate action by the government. They should recognize women fundamental roles in food system and in responsible and are very responsible in uh, addressing COVID-19. In doing so, they should acknowledge and protect women land rights now than ever. In the long term, securing uh, land rights is key to post-COVID-19 economic recovery. And there's need for effective, efficient, and sustainable response now to lay the foundation for a just recovery after pandemic. It's also my hope that the government will ensure that you have gender responsive uh, actions and respond during COVID-19 uh, measures. It's high time for the governments in Africa to fully support the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, CADAP framework and Africa Free Continental Trade Area uh, framework to ensure we have enough food reserve and improve livelihood during post-COVID-19. Finally, uh, there's a letter from the future that reads, the status, the status of women, the tailors of the soil by the traditions, rose exponentially. It is my hope that government will put in place measures now and the post pandemic to implement all commitment on land rights and also food security in Africa. I'm looking forward to full implementation of the latest de joint declaration by agriculture ministers from Africa in response to COVID-19 crisis to supporting access to food, nutrition for Africa, most vulnerable, including women. This is one step in the right direction. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I've done justice with time. Uh, Dr. Excellent, excellent, Grace. You've done Thank very you. well. And I think, um, friends and uh, members, what is emerging is that uh, in this era of COVID, the first thing that we see is this not just um, abandonment, but also displacement, mm -hmm. that uh, women in particular are being displaced uh, from their various positionalities and locations. So double displacement, positionalities in terms of uh, the political and um, social power, is being eroded by COVID, and then their physical location in terms of community land is also under the threat of being swept away. And uh, what we've had uh, in the first phase of conversations is linking up here very well, that for you to design adequate response, you must see this as an ecosystem issue, where there's a linkage between land, gender rights, food rights, you know, um, right to property, uh, right to participation and a big bundle of rights. So that ecosystem approach seems to be emerging as the optics with which to engage this. And thank you very much, Grace, for taking us forward in that route. One last thing that Grace has taken us through is to remind us of obligations and commitments that should be our referral points in engaging the question of women land rights and general community land rights in this context. And with that, I now want to invite another a great leader of our time, Madam Husna Barak, uh, situated at FAO. And uh, Husna is going to speak to us. Why is there such a laughter when I say great leader of our time? Uh, Husna is going to take us through uh, a reflection on what is happening to food security and food value chains in this context of uh, COVID and the uh, women's land rights. But, Husna, as you come in, I would like you to enter by answering a question. What is Kilimanjaro Initiative? So in your introduction, <laughs> you know that you are really in the forefront of this Kilimanjaro Initiative alongside the ActionAid 
and um, Oxfam and the uh, Kenyan Land Alliance and the uh, Reconcile the, and the groups, but please enter by answering that question. Husna, Karibu, you have, because I praised you so much, you have seven minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. I must say he has been my mentor all through. So he has known uh, where I personally have gone through and uh, where we are, but he's been a great partner also, and especially in uh, fronting uh, the land reform agenda in this country. So thank you very much. Uh, I re uh, all protocol observes, I recognize uh, my sister, uh, Trufosa, Grace, uh, Faith, uh, and, and the rest of panelists, but also recognize all the participants who've uh, logged in to listen, but also to raise the issue concerning the topic of uh, discussion. As mentioned, my name is Husna. I work for Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations based here in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and working around the land and natural resources, but, but of course, broadly, or in the context of uh, food security. Uh, I must recognize uh, most of the, of the points which were brought up by, by panelists, but also congratulate the government uh, uh, through the efforts they've done in uh, securing uh, tenure rights in this country. And we are glad and privileged to be part of the, of the partners in this, uh, in this uh, uh, sector. Uh, one, uh, sorry, this is a special mention to the uh, chairman, uh, uh, National Land Commission uh, uh, chairman. Uh, we truly appreciate uh, your discussion here, but also the, the efforts of the commissioner of the commission within the, the land sector. And we are glad to be also partners uh, with you. One, one important uh, thing is that uh, we are discussing COVID-19 uh, and the effects uh, on, uh, on all aspects of manners in this country, especially land and food security, but also We've in this era as a country, but also as a region, we faced uh, so many other calamities, including the natural resource calamities, flooding and, uh, and um, other natural uh, calamities which have, uh, have faced. We've had uh, floodings in the Kenyan region. We've had uh, uh, most of the, I mean, winds and uh, destroying uh, properties. Uh, we've uh, had, uh, the biggest uh, and actually uh, never seen uh, like that before the desert locusts uh, menace uh, in the east african region and uh, followed on is now the covid-19 uh, pandemic which has put uh, the african region in a very very awkward situation one is uh, to balance the economic uh, setup to balance uh, livelihood to balance um, aspects of uh, of, of, of food uh, security has been a whole uh, big uh, job to be done. But I must confess that uh, it all comes with, uh, with great uh, governance uh, structures put in, uh, in each of the region. Uh, the lessons we've, uh, we've, we've, we've seen uh, in, in, the, in the region and specifically Kenya are quite, uh, are quite huge. And we all know that uh, over 70% of each country's population cannot really access food currently. And uh, we've seen even in, uh, in, in, in president's uh, speeches or head of country's uh, speeches, trying to see how they can balance the aspects of uh, uh, food security, the aspects of economic uh, stability the, and the aspects of uh, mitigating and uh, mitigating the, the pandemics. So it's been quite a huge task. And uh, if I look at what has happened already in the de desert locust, as much as we might want to celebrate, there are not much of it in the country, but it took a lot of uh, resources to be taken, I mean, put in and be able to be taken out, but also to prepare mitigation strategy for future uh, pandemics if they ever happen, but also how to deter them from not, I mean, from not happening. And I must mention the aspects of the effects of the, the they say the floods uh, on land, how much land we've lost uh, out of floods and the landslides. You can see what is happening, for example, in Tana River County in Kenya, where now you have to, to, to move 
uh, people from uh, lower areas to higher areas, that already changes the whole setup of, uh, of, uh, of the community. So there is quite a huge, um, huge loss in that. We've looked at measures being put under COVID and how much effects they've had into, uh, into the food security. An example will be in terms of the, in terms of the, the supply chain where we have uh, how much uh, uh, effects it has had. Uh, let's say, for example, the cessation of, of movement, how much could, uh, could a community or how much could a, a, a grassroots uh, woman be able to, to move uh, to go sell uh, their, uh, their produce? The closures of markets uh, uh, in this regard, uh, the aspects of um, restaurants where where they are the, the main buyers of uh, a lot of agriculture products uh, from, uh, from, from the farmer, uh, how it has costed. And I, I must say, even with, the, with, with schools closures, you know very well their lunch uh, and the boarding schools uh, uh, farm produce. Uh, so that's also another market closed for, for, for farmers or for, for, for agriculture. Uh, produce to be to be sold. So all that has affected uh, markets. All that has affected in so many ways the economy, the cash flow, and meaning that so many businesses ventures are closing down. If not, they have closed down because uh, there are no there are no markets for their for their produce. And I must say also in regards to not only the the the, the, the supply chain after the production, but also in regards to to the inputs. Uh, we, we, we know that borders have been closed and uh, also especially with, with cross-border movements, uh, things which are imported within a country cannot happen because of uh, the measures being put of uh, cessation of uh, movements where you're not, I mean, you're restricted to move from one country to, to the other. So there is a lot of um, loss in that regard and that already affects up to up to uh, the business uh, levels it doesn't matter from uh, from uh, small scale to to large scale and i must say this this has really really been noted and uh, as much as we say they are essential uh, goods they can move but the slowness at the borders for example we've seen huge uh, traffic uh, in bo at border points to make sure that we we test uh, the the drivers uh, uh, to see if they they infect, I mean, they are affected by the, I mean, they infected by the the virus or not, and the delays in the processing. So uh, colleagues here have mentioned the aspects of even the delays. Actually, the CSP, the delays in terms of uh, reducing the 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 the, the human uh, within the land administration uh, aspects. All that has has effect on uh, on uh, how much we can uh, we can uh, transact within the food. Uh, the food system so that that already is seen and it's really seen in a in a very big uh, big way but i'm i'm I, I must say that as much as uh, we are talking about the negative aspects on uh, on food security all is not uh, lost and i must i must mention one one of the things which has happened out of this is um, and which has been um, documented there is a lot of uh, migration uh, uh, from urban to, to rural. So we are anticipating that uh, the, the revamp uh, immediately after everything has cooled off, the revamp of the rural economy will uh, be able to, I mean, will be up positively because most people now are rushing back to the rural areas to see what they can do out of loss of jobs, out of loss of, um, of uh, their businesses within the, within the urban uh, sectors, but also the keenness within the nutrition, uh, the, uh, eating for, for immunity, eating well. Uh, and I must say now, uh, one of the things which we've seen uh, is going to be promoted a lot is the aspects of uh, promoting the indigenous uh, nutritious uh, food. It could be vegetables, it could be the cassavas and the potatoes we know. It could be the way we keep our livestock and how we can have our, our well um, uh, nutrients uh, preserved, but also in regards to to how much keenness 
a person has taken in it to, to be able to develop or to enhance his or her immunity, which has been has been one of the areas said that, that for you to, to, to not to be impacted by COVID, you have to be able to eat well. So that is also another another thing which we might not lost, but also promote further in regards to what has gone through the, the, the during the pandemic. Uh, one thing is, uh, importantly, and especially within within the, the land sector, is the aspect of recognizing a change of strategy, especially in the promotion of uh, uh, conservation activities, but be able to to look at best way of producing or sustainably uh, sustainable uh, production without uh, losing out on on, on the land. Uh, so as we are able to manage the land, uh, the land well. And I'm, uh, for as far we are really promoting the aspects of farm forests, where you you can do or farm trees. You can be able to to do your farming, but be able to have trees uh, and uh, protect or conserve the environment, avoiding wind and also mitigating the the floods and uh, and other natural uh, calamities which come with the, the loss of. Uh, or, the, or uh, put up a def deforestation uh, 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 process within that. Uh, I have a few recommendations which we might want to, to put in place. And I know that Kenya as a country also has put up a lot of measures, uh, both short term and, uh, and long term. But one thing is, uh, uh, one of the recommendations I really want to put forward, or we want to put forward, is the aspects of adoption of resilience uh, measures or crops which can can undertake uh, can take uh, I mean they don't need a lot of uh, tillage or uh, work on it but more of they can adopt to the climate of that uh, area but also the aspects of uh, the, man the sustainable land use management practices which uh, needs to be promoted a lot to avoid uh, all these other floodings but of and others should be like the agriculture outputs which should and i think when uh, grace was talking about the 30 percent uh, uh con concentration of budgets within a country kenya ha is at that point but they need more more robust uh, strategies to be able to implement uh, to implement the same what i must say is that uh, one of the key aspects within uh, the african contest and kenya we need to really promote the smallholder because that is where most of the production comes uh, from. Uh, the smallholder businesses or farmers, uh, that is means that they are doing it at the small scale. So more of governance and organization of, of the same to be able to curb the, the food uh, security, uh, uh, sorry, the food, the food sec security inadequacy. So as we are able to, to make sure we reach out and every other 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 produce uh, from uh, from the farm be able to reach the the table or the fork as uh, as required. But this should be having I mean should this should have measures put in place and especially the aspects of cooperatives where the promotion of cooperative uh, system to be able to have a good bargain for the smallholder farmer, which uh, majority are women in uh, in 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 this uh, in this regard. Uh, so policy and strategies needs to be to be put in place. The aspects of uh, inclusions of um, the private sector within the discussion is very very key in this. So as it doesn't become a, a, a government uh, only uh, mitigation or uh, work, but it should be like a whole uh, a wholesome. Uh, uh, participatory approaches uh, to, to right. do this business. That, that, that's recognition. So are you stopping me, Dr. Ari? No, no, I have no powers to stop you. Okay. I was, <laughs> I was only guiding you that uh, the borrowed time is over. Okay, okay. One, uh, one more, just, uh, just additionally to the community land uh, discussion. I must say that uh, the awareness uh, is required to be done all around. And I'm glad that uh, the government is taking to, is taking charge, but also the, the the civil society organization are really 
uh, bringing out their role very well. But one recognition which we have to do is not only about registration of community land. And this regard, when we are talking about COVID, we are talking about uh, the, the, the floods, you're talking about desert locusts, is also about the other two components. As much as we recognize the community as communities, but also we need to recognize the protection aspects of uh, of the of the of the tenure regime within community land and this brings out the aspects of the land use management the aspects of um, of uh, making sure that the land is is conserved and is used as required for for the for the other uh, generation or for the next generation and this already will enhance uh, productivity will enhance uh, economic uh, um, uh, age of the of the of the community. So this is very very important. As we are we are rushing to also delimit or to to adjudicate land. Let's make sure we we really take into consideration the aspects of protection and the management of uh, of the of the same land. Because most of the land degradation, most of, finally most of the land degradation aspects are really within the, our community lands, and we've seen it. The vastness of our arid and semi-arid areas which we, we normally say they are just uh, land with, with no owners, but most of the degradation takes place in those areas. So it's high time that we make proper strategies for us to be able to, to manage and use the land uh, well. But thank you very much for, for the time and I'll hope I'll be able to add in more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Husna. That is um, well put and the key thing there mobility, that when movements are, um, uh, are uh, dis disabled, then the communities and most of women sort of lose uh, significantly. But it's also the relationship between the whole big continuum of change. So we look at COVID, but we must look at it in the, with the continuum of uh, uh, climatic conditions, the continuum of uh, invasion of locusts, with the continuum of agricultural practices and all of them cumulatively therefore give us imagery of what people are experiencing and especially women. A uh, couple of good recommendations, go indigenous and uh, it's time therefore to rethink our idea of what is modern. What is modern is not necessarily what is Western. And um, in fact, often what is modern is actually what we've adapted to for many years that have passed by. And that takes us to an excellent conversation towards the end. The final panelist, Dr. Sena. Dr. Sena is a long standing uh, activist in the indigenous peoples uh, movement um, space. He's a former chair of the United Nations Permanent Commission for the Rights of the Indigenous People. And uh, over the years, has advanced the rights of indigenous people significantly uh, through his current portfolio um, in Africa. And I want to request him to give us his insights as well. And he's promised me, I thank you for being a friend. He's promised me to take five minutes. I'll give you six minutes. So Karibu, six minutes for you. So uh, thank you for giving me those uh, six minutes to discuss this very, very important issue on the role of marginalized communities in protecting their lands, territories during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, First of all, uh, as I look, when I look at the list of uh, participants, including the attendees, um, I see very few uh, representatives of marginalized communities present. So I'm just wondering whom will I be actually talking to in this discussion, but I hope that the rest of you who will, who will listen uh, will maybe support some of these uh, measures that we may discuss. So when we look at the role, we're meaning uh, what, 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 is the, what, what part will they play in the lands uh, uh, that they either, either they live in or belong to them. So when we look at indigenous or marginalized communities generally, uh, we see that um, first, uh, their land rights are hardly recognized in most parts of Africa uh, under formal law. But when you look at uh, the context of uh, indigenous law, then uh, we can say that uh, they own a lot of land, almost 60% of the continent under indigenous law, though this has not been recognized in formal law. So I think that the first thing that we need to discuss in this uh, forum going forward is the interrelationship between uh, indigenous law and formal law. Uh, 
and I would want to uh, to to maybe just point out uh, one case that we that may be of interest to the panelists to follow, and that is the Richtavel community case in uh, South Africa, which said that formal law did not extinguish indigenous law. So basically, that means that uh, indigenous rights in all parts of Africa should be recognized under indigenous law. I would ask you to to read uh, that law, that uh, that case. So when we look at uh, land, the land of indigenous people generally in the continent, they lost it through three main means. One, through laws and policies which were formulated without their participation or consent, through uh, force, and this is something that all of you are aware of, and through treaties, agreement, uh, treaties and agreements and other constructive arrangements like we see in the Maasai case of 1904 and 1911. So they have lost their lands to some of the major projects, which includes major projects in the energy sector, wind, geothermal, solar, hydro, whereas Africa actually works towards uh, lighting up the continent. They have lost their lands to extractive industries, oil and gas, minerals, and etc. They have lost their lands through agriculture, largely agricultural investments, uh, mostly through arrangements with other countries like Oman. Uh, they have also lost their lands through conservation. Uh, we see that most parks, all, almost all the parks are indigenous people's territories. And they have also lost their lands through large scale infrastructure projects like the Lapset Corridor, which, uh, uh, which uh, all of you are maybe aware of. So when we look at uh, indigenous peoples in the context of COVID-19 and their land rights, a lot has been discussed by the various panelists. Uh, but we, one of the key uh, thing that has emerged uh, in this context of the pandemic is that the health of indigenous leaders, indigenous land rights leaders is at risk in most of Africa. And in fact, from experiences we are seeing from other parts of the world like South America, most of them are, have, have even died as a result of COVID-19. So this puts the struggle uh, under, under, under risk, the struggle for land rights under great risk. We also see uh, the issue of access to registries has been discussed here, and I really appreciate that uh, the, the, the lands ministry has participated here and talking about what they, what, they are, what they are doing. The livelihoods and cultures, which are closely attached to the lands they live in, have also, also been greatly impacted, and we have, we have seen about uh, food security. Uh, when we look generally also, the issue of uh, the sustainable development goals generally uh, has been impacted by uh, COVID and this has a direct impact on how indigenous people's lands uh, will be recognized going forward. However, when we look at what has been happening over the last few years, uh, we see some very positive uh, things that have been coming uh, through, increasing recognition and support to community land rights struggles. We see a lot of law and policy changes in over 20 countries, including in Kenyan constitution, and then we see decisions from courts and other human rights mechanisms recognizing the land rights of these communities. So what are the, some of the recommendations that I would put forward for communities to pursue? Number one, it will be important for communities actually to, first of all, during the COVID-19 pandemic, as we have heard that most of the educated indigenous people have gone back to their villages, build the technological capacity of your people so because uh, we, a lot of uh, people from your communities could actually be now part of this discussion that we are having here. So we are talking about them uh, in their absence. So because of the technological challenge. And I just would like to give one example. Uh, two weeks ago, I visited about 10 primary schools in very remote areas in Mount Elgon, Baringa, and et cetera. And I found that all these schools had these government issued tablets, but since they were, taken to the schools in 2019, they have not been used. Because one, the teachers are not trained. Number two, the head teachers think that the people would destroy them. Despite as even solar panels have been, having been provided to power these things. So number two, awareness of COVID-19 and of course the Community Land, right, uh, land Act and regulations. Uh, in most places that have been over the last few areas, People think that COVID-19 is a city disease. And now with the lockdown restrictions having been removed, uh, more people will be going back to the villages and this will pose a greater risk to, the, uh, to indigenous communities, including their land rights. 
And of course, most of what they say is that they are not even aware of the Community Land Act in Kenya, for example, and the regulations. And this is what we also hear in all of Africa. So we need a lot of awareness around these activities. Uh, number three, uh, the communities should continue pursuing their land rights through the legal channels that they are pursuing, courts, uh, human rights mechanism generally, and including seeking interpretation of some constitutional language. Like for example, when we look at the Kenyan context section, uh, Article 63D1 recognizes uh, community land to include land um, historically occupied by hunter gatherers. But even in this discussion, I've not heard anything about hunter gatherer communities being discussed. I've just heard about uh, uh, pastories. So uh, we, we have a few success stories that they can borrow from Ogeke, Sendoroi, Zenama, the Basarwa communities, and etc. So um, they should also, once, uh, one big challenge that has also been discussed here is that indigenous people are not only losing, uh, are not only uh, struggling to get land, but they are losing what they already have through land sales. So they should stop this as a big responsibility. So mapping, uh, 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 mapping of their lands, documentations, uh, and establishing inventories of their lands, uh, resources, and management practices. They should also build their economies because, as we have heard from the various uh, panelists, uh, uh, their livelihood systems and food security is a big challenge, largely because of poverty. So they have a lot of resources that they can start building their economies and also contribute to the national economies. So resolving land conflicts and intra-community equity would be necessary uh, in implementation of the Community Land Act, not only in Kenya, but in other places. And then most importantly is the strengthening of consultation and decision-making mechanisms within those community structures so that it becomes easy uh, for people, for some of these uh, ideas to be actualized in, in their territories. Uh, partnerships with government, private sector, NGOs, uh, is uh, very, very critical. And I would like to give you a brief example of what is happening right now in the East Mao. Uh, the government is actually undertaking evictions of people, but the Ugeg, who are historical occupants of the forest, have decided to support the government efforts to evict migrant communities. And consequently, the government has uh, formed a committee of, composed of Ugeg to to delimit the boundaries of, of, the, of the Mao forest in this side. So that can, those kind of arrangements. But most importantly then in the context of uh, a mega project is training on negotiation skills. This is lacking in all communities, uh, but we have good examples already where training uh, has been done and successful negotiation that benefited the community has been undertaken. Undertaken, this includes the Kipeto Energy Project in Kajiado, the Roibos example in South Africa, among others. So uh, I think uh, because of the time I was given, I'll stop there and hope that uh, uh, the, the marginalized community representatives who are part of this discussion today will give uh, further inputs. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Sen. I think. Uh... Uh, Dr. stepped out a little bit. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, is Dr. back? I like the, 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 the recommendations you've made, the, the issue of uh, capacity building communities to be able to engage with technology, because this is the space we are in and um, communities have to understand how to engage with, with technology in order to have meaningful contributions. Um, all over Africa, um, I like the precedents you've noted. I think it's a high time we also put in our voices uh, on social legitimacy of some of these uh, uh, projects that are being undertaken uh, in our community, on our community lands. Um, I'd like to, I don't know if Dr. Terry is back, I'm filling in a little bit. I'm back. Uh, thank you for holding. If I was uh, a bit worried, that was that was a coup d'état. But uh, <laughs> thank you. We have uh, about um, 15 minutes remaining. We want to use that for Q and A. A lot of questions have been posted to 
the portal and uh, I am not sure whether you can all see the questions from where you were. There was a little bit of um, a technical hinge from, our, from the studio. So we seems to, yeah, we are trying to get back the questions back to our, our screen here. Uh, yes, here we are. Now, uh, most questions have been flagged to the National Land Commission. And I'm so glad, Mr. Chair, thank you very much that we have uh, three commissioners who have also joined and have been uh, listening all through. And uh, I would like to give the commissioners a lot of time to answer most of the questions. But before I go to the commissioners, I want to request Faith kindly to explain to the participants in this forum what is the Kilimanjaro Initiative? And then after that, we'll go to other questions. Uh, uh, Hushna um, didn't avoid it, but left it for you. Uh, Faith, please. Uh, the Kilimanjaro campaign is a com is, was a, is, because it's still much alive, it's a global campaign whereby uh, uh, women land rights champions have come together to demand for their fair share of land, women's la right to land. Uh, the Kilimanjaro campaign was regional in Africa, but we also had a Kenyan chapter, which at regional level, it was led by Oxfam. Uh, at national level, it was led, it is being led by 17 organizations. And the culmination of this campaign was in um, Arusha, Tanzania, where we had women land rights champions uh, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro uh, to express uh, their, 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 their opinions and their rights, and, and, and just saying that it's time women's voices are heard on matters land. So right now we are in the process of developing tools, gender tools that would be, and we are glad that the ministry is working with us. We're in the process of developing gender tools that would be used when evaluating the involvement of women on land rights matters. I know that FAO and the ministry are the forefront of developing agenda policy at the ministry as one of the key activities and that uh, FAO is, is spearheading, but also has a link uh, with Kilimanjaro. I know that there, there is a framework that uh, can be used when you're talking about women and land at national level. I know at regional level, the GMAC and uh, um, gender campaign has really taken the forefront on, on, on this Kilimanjaro campaign. So it's a global campaign highlighting the importance of women's participation and inclusion on land governance processes. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much for that. Uh... Faith, another ground clearing question that um, has been raised, uh, which I want to push to Hushna. Hushna, the question has been raised, how do you balance the contradiction between uh, the use of GMOs and pesticides and promotion of indigenous uh, food? And please just take one minute, Hushna. These are ground clearing questions before we come to the commissioners. And in the meanwhile, Chair, please prepare yourself for a, a plenty of questions. Who's Nakarim? Thank you very much. I, th I think that's a very, very good uh, question. And uh, that is what is happening uh, on in, in, within, our, within our setup, uh, the promotion of GMOs. But one question has, uh, has been raised. What are the nutrition uh, components of each of the of, of, of the foods we are we are producing and that is very very key and uh, currently i think the, the the various governments are taking into consideration there are various laws on pesticides there are various ro laws on uh, on the g i mean the, the mass production uh so as to be able to encompass the aspects of, of nutrition so that is very very important and it's up to each and every uh, member state who are who are signatory to the various uh, uh, chemicals uh, uh, laws and treaties to be able to affect it. But we are we are we are we are really promoting the aspects of nutrition, and that's where now we say that is those are the mitigation fa uh, factors around what 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 food should be produced and at what uh, nutrition uh, best and also the control of uh, the pesticides the fertilizer and various chemicals which are harmful to those 
practices. So I know, I know there is that because for a long, for a long time, the promotion of, uh, I mean, the mass production is what has been promoted being promoted, but currently the aspects of nutrition is what is really pegged on it. And I think that is the why, pro, uh, what do you call it, the promotion of the indigenous uh, uh, and uh, best practices on how to, to produce, uh, which is enough for everybody, but also to produce what is good and what is well in terms of nutrition. Thank you very much, Madam Husna. Uh, a question will be coming to you, Madam Achar, on the question of public land and uh, the process of converting community land, can community land be converted into public land? And can public land be converted into community land? Uh, as you think through that question, some announcements that are important for you to note. One is that uh, the entire recording of this session shall be uploaded in the website of the Kenya Land Alliance um, pretty soon within the week. At the same time, we are going to request Madame Achar to send us a speech of the Honorable Cabinet Secretary, which we'll also flag up there. And I uh, have one advice though. You know, we all listen to radios and we watch TVs. There's no day that the TV presenter will ever give you her notes or his notes. But we remember everything. So beyond the website, I want to request you please, remember, pick up key lessons here, use it for your own initiatives and so on. So let's go to this question, Madam Achar public land, community land, conversion process. Meanwhile, Dr. Sena, be ready for the question of technology. And the question here is that, uh, how do you leverage technology to be able to promote community land rights, especially digitization? And you raised this very well uh, during your presentation. Madam Achara. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, our moderator for taking us through well and uh, to the question that has been asked with regards to conversion of either community land to public land and conversion of public land to community land and vice versa. I want to also add conversion of private land to community land and vice versa. Uh, I want to draw attention that uh, uh, Community Land Act has made provisions for conversion, number one. And number two, there are legal mechanisms that have been put in place where, where, where we have public land and the government have made a decision. And uh, I want to say this uh, knowing that we have the chair of National Land Commission on board, that there are uh, processes and step-by-step -step legal mechanism that have been put with regards to conversion of public land to community land, community land to public land, uh, private land to public, private land to community and vice versa. So uh, in a nutshell, I just say that conversion from one land tenure to another is allowed. And all of that is legislated uh, in our legal framework. Now, unless there's a specific question as to a specific scenario, then I just need to answer that question generally that the legal mechanism provides for that. Thank you, Chair. We want to bring a short video presentation from a, a colleague of ours in um, Latin Mexico, uh, Brazil, sorry. Uh, who has been partnering with the Kenya Land Alliance to try and see how to use technology in leveraging community land rights. So please let's upload that and that will also aid Dr. Sena in speaking back to this issue. So please for two minutes, let's watch this. The situation of traditional peoples and communities in Brazil is very worrying at this time. The pandemics exposed the vulnerabilities in healthcare and access to public policies, and of course, regarding registration and land tenure processes. Land conflicts haven't disappeared. They have even increased in the last months in some regions. Brazilian organizations are monitoring these problems here, like Kenya Land Alliance is do doing currently in Kenya. 
We may notice that the impacts of COVID-19 on traditional peoples, peoples and communities will be similar despite being different countries. Uh, however, unfortunately, our federal government does not contribute to solving these problems, but in fact create other ones. Uh, the president of Brazil uh, is deliberately against indigenous peoples, quilombolas and other social groups, and even uh, against environmental protection. So we have additional elements in this struggle for land and for cultural protection. I am Sheila Dourado. I am a visiting professor at the University of uh, Uberlândia, Federal University of Uberlândia at the Law School. And I'm part of the team of New Social Cartography who works jointly with KLA in Kenya and in Brazil since 2015. Greetings to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sheila and Kelly have been working with the OGEC here in this project of a developing new cadastral um, mapping. Basically, and the and idea here of the project is to make visible community rights and community interests that are ordinarily not seen as visible in the conventional land registration system. And that really responds directly to the question that uh, was being flagged by uh, Diana Washira from Pamoja Trust. But I want to invite Dr. Uh, Sena to just say another, to add a comment to that. Dr. Sena, anything to add on that question of technology and indigenous and community land rights? Yes, uh, th there, is a, there is a lot of advantage now of trying to leverage technology to support uh, indigenous land rights. First of all is uh, we, 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 we have to look at the availability of uh, uh, technologies. We, we see that the uh, smartphones and tablets are widely available, including even in very remote areas. Like I just gave you an example of uh, the tablets for school program by the government. It's uh, uh, available even up in Mount Elgon, remote, one of the remotest places you can go to. Um, the mobile phone companies, their networks are all over the place now and that means is it internet to easy access to the internet so uh, this technology could help uh, create awareness on land rights help training for example by setting up video links to the villages now during the covid 19 era uh, the land registry as we've been told is also digitizing so of course even though the communities are also technologically aware then it becomes easy for them to digitize Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Thank okay. you very much. I was afraid you are going into a new presentation. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it to the Chair, National Land Commission. Chair, in the chat, there has been a flood of questions. But the questions can be summarized into two. And the last, uh, Lothier Henry has really pushed it to the key questions. The first question is, this notion of registration, isn't it equal to privatization and commodification of what was ordinarily communally owned community land? So can you eliminate on this question of registration and clarify whether or not it is not to a large extent privatization of community land? The second question is this community land is it only in Sahel regions? Does it exist all over the country? Those are the two principal questions among the big avalanche of questions that I think if you answered in precise detail would help a lot of participants to get a feel of what community land rights are and what the new statutes are advancing. Chair, back to you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, chair of the session, I, I, the notion of uh, registration. Uh, well, let, let just let me let me make this clear because this is these are just these are constitutional uh, uh, provisions, uh, the categorization of various categories of land, and uh, you do have private land, you have public land, and you have uh, um, community land. 
that's already clear that those are different, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, aspects of of, of, uh, of land. Now, since you actually have private land clearly spelled out in the constitution, and what is public land and what is community land, the Sorry, we seem to have a, a hinge with the chair there again. Uh, Mr. Tauta. Registration does not uh, and his session. Yes. Sorry, we had lost you for a minute. Please go on. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what happens when I'm presenting because I've been following the process. I mean, the, the presentations, or it comes my turn, it keeps on disconnecting. I don't know whether it's my voice that is a little. Uh, too powerful for my gadget. No, your voice is okay, sir. It's just a problem of inadequate supply of technology. Yes. So, so uh, of course, there's always been a debate about uh, what is this uh, obsession, if you like, with with the registration. This obsession uh, that, um, uh, particularly in our country, that we have with uh, having uh, a title deed you know, some document that, that shows you have a right to, to land. But at the end of the day, what really is important is to know that, you know, there's always that bundle of rights that go with uh, with uh, access uh, or use to land or land tenure. So that uh, what matters really here is that we have those categories. And uh, the moment it's clear that this is community land, whichever way you treat it, it is a question of being clear. This community land as contrasted with public land. But I believe, I, I think uh, the, the whole idea of registration is to ensure that we have clear uh, categories where you can georeference and say from this point, the other point, the other point, this is public land, that is private land, and that's community land. So registration does not uh, mean privatization. And again, as I pointed out in my presentation, uh, these uh, different categories of land uh, they, they, they lie next to each other. So you will have a community land and next to it, next to it will be private land and somewhere along the way there will be, there will be public land. And uh, as again has been pointed out by uh, Mr. Achar, yes, conversion, there is, there is, uh, the law provides for conversion between the different categories. And uh, the most basic illustration is when you're talking about um, uh, about uh, uh, compulsory acquisition or projects. Let's take uh, the lab cell project, for instance, where we are doing uh, infrastructure uh, across uh, some of these uh, community lands. Uh, there is a process of acquisition, and once it's acquired, once it's, uh, you have a rail or you have a road, that is uh, public land. Now, uh, again, I also pointed out about the role of NLC in, uh, in land, in oversight, uh, in land planning. So in the process of land planning, which is a, a mandate of the respective counties, when the counties uh, engage themselves in planning, they must take into account certain uh, portions of land that will be public land for, for public use. We are going to have schools, we are going to have uh, other institutions that uh, should be public institutions that will be taken care of. So uh, there's always that con conversion between the various categories. So in short, uh, registration is not, is not privatization. But the more important question that should be asked, why registration? I think it's just to ensure that you are clear where the, the boundaries um, um, lie. The other question about whether the community land is just in what you describe as Sahel. And I, I suppose by that you mean the, the more Arid and semi-arid, the north, um, the eastern, sorry, the northeastern and northern uh, uh, areas, but uh, that, that that is not the case because uh, we have um, we have uh, we have areas like in, in Kajiado, for instance, where we have had uh, um, community ranches for for historically for a long time, uh, Kajiado, Narok. Uh, you have community land in, in, in Kitui, in uh, Taita Taveta, where you have group ranches, uh, and so on. So it's not, it's not just in, the, in what you call the, the Sahel regions. It, it's, uh, it's, 
across uh, a number of other counties. I hope that answers the two questions. Thank you. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, members. Um, um, our moderator, if you may excuse me just for a minute for clarity, I think it's important for the audience and all of us to, to, to note that when we are talking of community land, in a nutshell, we are talking about undissolved group ranches that are spread across the nation, number one. And number two, we are talking about parcels of land that are on community that have not been declared as adjudicated areas. So two category, undissolved group ranches, and number two, areas that have not been declared as adjudication areas. So if you have a parcel of land somewhere in community X, where adjudication and demarcation is going on, that is not community land. And lastly, I want to add that just as the chair has said, if you have community land X, within that community land X, there would be a portion of it that is public land. There would be a portion of it that is community land. And when it comes to registration of community land, all the portions that are within community land that are public and all the portions that are community land owned by the community are actually titled differently. Thank but you very in, much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that was very important clarification. Um, I only want to add a caveat that uh, um, we would have needed much more time. Uh, and I think the panelists would need to meet to agree on how to resolve some of the very important questions that have been raised here. I think we can't just leave them like that. Um, I think the clarifications offered are excellent. Um, participants, sorry that we didn't have time to allow you to verbalize, but uh, we have responded to some of the core questions. We've also learned a lot from you. I want to request that before you log out, if you have any other question that uh, you think would be important for us to take into account uh, in building and sort of giving this conversation useful conclusions, please type it out there. And for now, before we sign off, we want to flag out again another important uh, learning example that speaks to most of the discussion that have been held here. And that's from um, a fellow anthropologist from Brazil, also working on this matter, Professor Alfredo Wagner, who has uh, worked on territorial rights for minority groups in Brazil for many years. And it's part of this common project that we've been doing together um, with themselves. Uh, together here, I mean the Kenyan Alliance and the university and two universities in Brazil. So let's listen to Professor Alfredo. And after that, we'll be bringing the session to a closure. Professor Alfredo. In these pandemic times, Brazil has one of the highest number of fatal victims of COVID-19. Now, in the second week at July, we are researching the mark of 75,000 deaths. This is a tragedy. Here in the Amazon, there are more than 1,000 indigenous people infected and hundreds of dead. There are also hundreds of quilombolas killed by COVID-19, and the communities are frightened by so many victims. There is governmental negligence and measures to combat coronavirus, coronavirus, sorry. And the prospects are dire. Soon, we will exceed 100,000 that people, traditional communities are desperate, desperately demanding an emergency pandemic facility as the elderly, leaders, health workers, and environmental agents are dying. That is, tools who have the memory and the history of peoples and the communities. 
My name is Alfredo Wagner, and I am professor in the Federal University of Amazon and research at the New Social Cartography Project. Thank you. I, I note that uh, there are people who raised their hands. I'm so sorry that uh, it's not possible to give us an opportunity to uh, verbalize our questions because of time. We were meant to finish at uh, four o'clock. It's now 4.20. I want to invite the panelists to say bye-bye in their own ways. I will start with um, uh, Dr. Sena. Just say one word and bye-bye. Dr. Sena. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, not only to you, Kenya Land Alliance, but to all the participants and the attendees. This is a very important uh, topic and uh, will be available to continue this discussion in other avenues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Madam Grace. Um, thank you, everyone, for creating time to participate uh, uh, in this webinar. Um, my call is just uh, we need to all hands together and ensure that uh, women land rights not only feature in AU agenda, but to also ensure the implementation part of it is, is realized, especially now during COVID-19. Let's take advantage of this pandemic to engage with our policymakers at our different le levels in, the, in our countries. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Madam Achar. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I would want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers, the conveners, all the panelists, and more specifically, all the participants that took time to log in to learn more about uh, community land acts and COVID. And uh, my request is we could organize more of this so that we should be able to address many of the questions that are streaming from the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Madam Husna. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers, uh, to the moderator and the, and the audience uh, and my fellow panelists. Uh, one word uh, for, for the land reform agenda to be realized and especially the community land agenda. Uh, there is no prescription uh, to it. It has to, to have everybody on board and we have to bring all angles. Uh, into the discussion, both uh, ethnically and the and the so-called uh, modern uh, uh, prescription. So let's all join hands, and I I support the partnership. Thank you. Thank you, the chairman, National Land Commission, Mr. Otachi. Did the chair? Yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 thank. I want to. Um, thank all the um, participants uh, and uh, once again thank um, the, uh, the organizers of this forum and uh, just as uh, Mr. Shah has uh, indicated I think it's important that we have more of this kind of uh, discussions but I think there was a lot more that we could like to discuss that we have discussed today um, and as has as, as become clear there is this uh, uh, clear interlink between community land public land, private land, and uh, a discussion on community land must be uh, contextualized in that sense. Uh, and uh, lastly, um, the, there is always that issue of what the law says and, and what is actually the situation on the ground. And uh, considering that uh, this whole concept of community land is comparatively new and uh, the communities that are directly affected uh, would need to internalize it and have to live with it. Uh, and considering that um, this, this community land covers a large area of the country, it's really important that uh, these kind of discussions are held in this kind of fora and other fora across, um, across the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. I now want to give it to our lead partner and host, uh, Madam Faith Alube to give us her closing remarks and also announce to us our next session as everybody has requested. 
Madam Faith Karim. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Steve. Uh, thank you for, for moderating so well. This session has gone uh, very well, quite informative. I agree with most comments that it's been um, a short session. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Grace. We really appreciate um, your time and your insights um, on women land rights uh, across the region. Uh, we thank uh, all our participants who participated from wherever they've been across uh, uh, the continent. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Husna. Um, as usual, it's always a pleasure. Uh, we've been <laughs> working <laughs> together for so long. Thank you very much, Dr. Senna. Uh, quite a pleasure to have you on board. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Achar, uh, for creating time and for opening the CS. Uh, we really do appreciate. Um, uh, Chair, uh, 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 Commissioner Otachi, we, we are very grateful for creating time for this. And um, uh, I can assure everybody that this was just uh, the, first, the first webinar. We intend to do this. Uh, I have requested the panelists we meet as soon as possible so that I can see we have 29 questions that have not been really addressed as, as the, the participants had expected. Um, uh, from the panelists, I can assure you that they are going to look at the questions each by each, one by one, so that we can allocate where each question falls and each panelist is going to address each question. And um, we will communicate when the next webinar would be, but I would propose at least in two weeks. Um, I can see Madam Achar is agreeing with me, so two weeks it is. <laughs> we can have it in two weeks, um, the, the third week of August, uh, whereby we are going to start with your questions so that um, it is clear where we are at. Uh, today, at our peak, we had 123 participants. Uh, we are at 78. So I'm so sure that um, next time we are going even to be more. So the dissemination strategy of this webinar, uh, I can say it's been successful. Uh, Asante Sana Daktari for, for moderating. Thank you very much, Lawyers Hub, for, for um, uh, Hosting us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kenya Land Alliance staff, for really working uh, around the clock to make this successful. Uh, Asante Sana. That's all I'd say, and then we'll communicate. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, as Faith has said, we'll see you again in this same, same platform, actually on the 13th of August. 13th of August. Um, Kenyan Under, the Kenyan Land Alliance, FAO, Pamoja Trust, and the judiciary are going to be hosting again here with the National Land Commission a session on alternative justice system and uh, land and natural resources. For me, it's been such a pleasure. I also learned that I have a new talent. I can be a TV presenter. So uh, in this era of COVID, I've just acquired myself a new job. For now, keep well, and let's keep protecting community land rights. Paul, Asante Nisana, Kwerini. Thank you.